So I wanted to start by asking your character, Aiden. He's a struggling actor, but he's a determined actor. When was it that you knew that you wanted to be an actor? Really as a kid, um, I was very young. I wasn't into sports at all. And my father um, did amateur dramatics. Um, in the States, we call it uh, community theater. And he was a lawyer, but he just did it for fun. And he was really good. And so going to see him do plays and especially since as a kid, every other kid was into sports and I couldn't care less. And there I was with my, seeing my dad be the lead in these plays. I just thought it was so exciting and he was funny and he was making people laugh. And I just thought like, wow, I wanna, I wanna do that. You can make people laugh, that's, that's a career. I wanna do that. And some of the funniest segments in this, I thought were the ones where your character's auditioning. Uh, so I want to know, what, is, what, do you what do you feel is your best audition and what do you feel is also your worst audition? My worst audition I remember was for Tom Holtz, who played uh, the famous actor who played Amadeus. And he was directing a play. And the play was so thick. It was, a, it was an adaptation of Cider House Rules. It was probably this thick. And uh, so I went in and he goes, do you have any questions? And I was trying to be funny. I went, yeah, on page 210. And there was silence. And he said, oh, you're one of those. And then there was more silence. And then I was expected to audition. <laughs> so that was the most uncomfortable audition I've ever had for Mr. Tom Holtz, AKA Mozart. <laughs> The best audition I ever had was Scrubs, because I auditioned six times. I, um, I kept getting called back. I kept making them laugh. More and more people ended up kept being in the room until the final audition. There were like 35 people in the room who decided my fate. And it was down to four of us. And, um, and I got it. And that obviously changed my whole life. So that was my best one. Well, I'd be right in thinking that I saw James Avery and I mean, how did that come about? I was thinking, that's just different. The late great, it was actually his last role. He just passed away. Um, and I wanted um, um, to have two African-American uh, um, known character actors on either side of me. I thought it would be even funnier if this guy is not only at the wrong audition, but there's two like known people up, up for the part. I mean, recognizable people. So... Um, so James Avery, you know, uh, is the dad from, from, from Fresh Prince, who's is super known and funny. And what I love about the story, actually, is he didn't even have a line. He was just doing me a favor to do a, a cameo. And he improv that joke that he said. Uh, Leslie says, uh, to my right, says, uh, I, played Othello, I played Othello, and he says, we all did. And that was his improv, and it gets a huge laugh in the theater. And it's the last line he ever spoke on film. So I really like that story because, you know, he his last line on film was a line that he improved and gets a huge laugh. So yeah, no, if I start talking about Fresh Prince, I won't stop. So all right, all I'm gonna say is right. I love that show. Yeah, um, I know it's very popular. <laughs> um, it's been a few years since Garden State, which is obviously your previous film. What did you learn about your process um, in that one that you took into making this one? Um, I think most importantly that there's so little time on set so that the amount of preparation you do beforehand is so important. You know, the, the ticking clock and the amount of money being spent every day is so ludicrous that, you know, we, ha we shot the Garden State in 25 days, we shot this movie in 26 days. So the more that I could plan, the better. I mean, I storyboarded every frame in this movie and, and, and learned to just think of every possible thing that could go wrong and then what I would do if that happened because you know, this, this film was pretty epic to execute in 26 days. So there was no time for like, you know, I, the last movie I did before this was Oz the Great and Powerful, which was the polar opposite. We shot for six months. There'd be like half days where we're just sitting around doing nothing. Um, so in this world of making small budget independent movies, you really, I, I think what I've learned is, is that the, you can't plan too much. You can't plan too much because then you can solve any problem really easily. And as someone who's now done TV, film, and theater, and I just got off the student on Broadway, do, do you have a preference now, or do you just see the sort of challenges in each? Just wherever the material's good, you know? When theater's great, I got to work with Woody Allen, one of my heroes on Broadway just now, and 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 and, and directing, of course, my own film is, is a passion of mine. Uh, and then TV, when it's good, you know? It's just, it's just a matter of, like, where is it good? Where are you working and learning with someone? And... And, and where it doesn't feel like work. You know, sometimes it feels like work. When it feels like work, it's bad. You know, because you're, you're so lucky and blessed to be doing what you love to do. So you have to catch yourself from like, 
this feels like work. That's a sign like this isn't good because it's it's so rare that you get to do it. So I just seek out good good scripts. Yeah. And your character, your character in this Aiden, his adult life hasn't quite gone the way he, he thought it thought it might. In the films that you've done beforehand, is there any experience which hasn't been quite what you thought it would have been? Yeah, I won't name the projects, but uh, <laughs> you can tell me after this. I'll okay. tell you after. <laughs> um, you know, one or two times, I would say once really in particular, I just showed up and um, and I was on a different page with the director, and that's rare for me because I, I get along with almost everybody, and we just weren't we weren't making the same movie, and it and it showed, and so um, that's that's tricky. You have to definitely be on the same page with, with everybody, especially your the lead and the director have to be on the same page. Okay. And I've heard that you cut an hour out of this movie. So yeah. if that's right, I just wanted to know what did you cut out? And why that? I cut an hour out of almost an hour out of Garden State too. I mean, as well, not a sequel that no one's seen. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, when you do when you shoot something in twenty six days, you're just shooting. It's like I th I tell young filmmakers, it's like a scavenger hunt. You, you're just collecting as much as you can. And you amass it all. And then, you know, by the time you do an assembly, it's two hours, 45 minutes, three hours long. So no one's going to sit through a three-hour movie. I mean, it's especially a movie like this. It's not out of Africa. So you have to you have to choose your... You have to shape it. It's like a cheesy analogy, but you have, you've, you've amassed this giant mound of clay. And little by little, over the course of 10 weeks or so, you have to start finding your movie. Where, where is the hour and 45-minute story in this three hours and you have to make really hard choices you have to cut stuff you love but ultimately even though you love it it's hurting the piece as a whole because that section feels too long or we go off on this tangent that that you know was good on the page but now doesn't work as well because of this xyz um that's the real challenge i mean i've been told that before that you find your movie in the edit room but you don't really learn it until you make a movie <clears throat> Bill Lawrence, who created Scrubs, is a really great editor, and, and, and he would come in early on to both films and be like, especially when it's not your baby, you can see it better. And he would go, you can't see this now, but X, Y, and Z aren't going to be in the film. And I'd be all indignant, like, what are you talking about? I would never cut X, Y, or Z. <laughs> and then, of course, by the end, I had cut X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. You know, um... That's 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 you know that's editing. Whether whether you're writing or making a film or you're whatever you're editing, you have to make tough choices, and a lot of it'll be on the DVD. So that's good. Some of it's um, some of it's good stuff that I was sad to see go, but it'll be on the DVD. Look forward to watching it. Right. Um, I was just going to ask finally, the music is such a big part of a film. I know Garden State, the soundtrack, obviously yeah. for that one. How did you go about sort of choosing which songs to add, and then also the score, and then when to use silence as well? Because I think the balance in this one. It's really good. Thank you so much. I, you know, it's funny. I'm known for music, but I think I use it sparingly because one of my pet peeves with the TV is rampant, but with movies it's bad too. Is just constant score. It drives me crazy because then then it doesn't have an effect. If you watch any TV show now, I'm sure your shows as well as ours, the score nonstop, telling you how to feel, manipulating you. And so what I try and do is strip it all away. And granted, I use I use it, all, but I but I, it's ideally more noticeable and effective because it's been stripped away. It's very rare, a couple times in this movie, a handful of times, but more often than not, there's no music underneath dialogue. It comes in for the transitions from scene to next, and scores obviously montages. But um, I try and let the dialogue speak for itself. So that when the music does come in, it's accentuate, accentuating a mood. It's not pushing a mood, ideally. Well, thanks for your time today. Thank you. You actually lived up to your, your, what you said you were going to do and asked me original questions. Awesome. <laughs> That's the aim. <laughs>